Good afternoon. It's Monday the 20th of November 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Welcome to the programme, Patrick. Thanks, Mike. Um, well, we're going to get straight on to it. Uh, and I'm going to say, Patrick, uh, happy Universal Children's Day. Uh, it's not World Children's Day, it's Universal Children's Day. But I thought this was a particularly delightful uh, cartoon that the United Nations has uh, decided to use to to, to promote this day. Uh, what do you think about it? Um, if this isn't the most disturbing illustration that uh, you've seen this week, uh, then I don't really know what is. So just, just for our listeners, uh, we've got uh, uh, some kind of cartoon creature standing in the center of uh, the Millennium Development Goals circle. Uh, and behind this creature is uh, what, six or seven other uh, what look like children, but they're of indeterminate gender uh, behind the, uh, the main character uh, with hashtag kids take over above their heads. Mm. Uh, and all the characters in the, uh, in the cartoon have, are winking and they've got their tongues hanging out. It's a pretty disturbing image. They've got their tongues out. Also, uh, you notice all the characters in the background are all wearing kind of a unisex dress or sort of it looks like some longer than others obviously but very subtle um, and clearly this character in the middle mic is not a child because he's clearly different than the ones behind so what is this is this uh, some sort of adult uh, creature or I, I don't know what it's supposed to signify but the whole thing to me is just a complete um, it's a it's a total mess it's quite unpleasant yeah. yes uh, well look uh, let's talk about some child exploitation then because uh, this is the drum their headline is google responds to brand safety reports it benefited from child abuse on youtube but in fact um you have the times here patrick and, and sure. it appears to have appeared on the front page of the times today as well yeah well this is actually from the weekend here but this was this was on the front page of the times of course you have to buy the paper now you can't actually see it online because of the uh the paywall. So, uh, but basically, this is the main story they were running with over the weekend. That you know, people have been profiting, Mike, off of YouTube videos that are exploiting children. The main feature here, the main evidence, is a uh, one called Toy Freaks, uh, where a father is uh, exploiting his, his two younger daughters, doing all these sort of dis disturbing uh, videos. Uh, one with her to tooth being pulled out and bleeding, and Another one with a, shaving the forehead of the daughter with the razor blade. Very bizarre stuff. Apparently, it's netted hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in ad revenue. But you, you read deeper into this. And then they sort of, as a secondary mic, they're talking about ISIS videos that basically made money uh, corporate advertisers. And so that's actually quite, in, in my mind anyway, a serious, um, uh, is equally serious and probably deserving of a front page uh, is, is the whole ISIS how ISIS was able to use Twitter, uh, Facebook, and YouTube to recruit um, a lot of their fighters and also to raise money for all the little ISIS charities to fund people's trips uh, to do jihad in Syria and Iraq. Of course, that went pretty much unnoticed and no one really cared uh, for the first three years uh, that ISIS was basically steamrolling over Syria and Iraq. So, interesting. Uh Okay, so so basically we're focusing on uh, a family unboxing lots of stuff and making some YouTube videos. Yeah, that mar you, you could say yes, he, uh, it's child exploitation by the father and the of the daughters. They talked about some other suggestive videos that uh, pedophiles were being interested in the comment sections and so forth. But uh, it it very much relied on this toy freaks case, Mike. Um, you know. How does this rank in the sort of larger scale of child exploitation in media? Um, well, let's see if we can't uh, sure. put it in a little bit of perspective on uh, Universal Children's Day. Uh, so here is uh, the European Solidar Solidarity Corps. So the European Union, quite happy to use younger, okay, older teenagers uh, to, uh, to carry out European Union projects of various kinds, all about inclusion and citizenship and all this kind of stuff. Uh, we've got uh, I Will Week, hashtag I Will Week, starting this week. Uh, you'll be glad to know all about that, Patrick, because that is all about uh, young people getting involved in, uh, in social uh, 
campaigns, uh, it's really about getting people into the NGO complex at an ever younger age. Uh, and uh, so I Will Week is uh, November 20th to 24th. Uh, they want to help uh, celebrate young people who lead social action in their capacity for bringing others together. So that's good stuff. Uh, here's what Theresa May had to say about it. All across the UK every day, young people are volunteering, campaigning and fundraising to create change. They're becoming ever younger change agents. Is that child exploitation? I think it probably is. Uh, we've got the Department for International Development. Well, they're celebrating World Children's Day today. A happy World Children's Day. Join us in building a safer, healthier and more prosperous world for future generations. Uh, how are we going to do that? By distributing Department for International Development money, uh, and which I think we could say is fomenting wars overseas. Uh, and most of these children are not benefiting in any way, shape or form from DFID money. But it's a great photograph. It's a great photograph. Great photograph, so absolutely. Definitely good uh, but for raising Pat, money. Uh, of course, in the meantime, uh, we are messing with children's minds. Well, this is interesting. This story came out uh, in the Daily Mail uh, in the last couple of days. A charity that helps transgender children says it has received 700% more calls uh, than three years ago. And so the charity, I think it's called uh, Mermaids, uh, and it's seen a 700% rise in calls and, and emails in the last three years and are they you know they talk about uh, uh, qu queries and uh, parents and children getting in touch with them about um, you know these transgender issues and uh, problems that children are encountering I don't really know exactly uh, you know what the provenance of, of this problem is Mike but I do know that uh, we could probably make a casual correlation at least at this point of that 700% rise in uh, transgender queries to that charity and also the implementation of um, uh, transgender and gender neutral education directives uh, in public schools. Do you think that's a fair correlation to make? Is, we could say that's causation. Uh, it could be, but uh, you know, then we also have the Telegraph saying that sexual education needs to be more graphic because teens are trying taboo practices. So that's a bit counterintuitive, actually. Um, they're so saying the things to be more graphic. Well, well, because you've got to you've got to explain to children uh, how to do things safely. You've got to explain to children how to carry out depraved uh, sexual deviant practices. You need to be more graphic about that. Well, is, that is that what the Telegraph is absolute, putting, absolutely. putting forth here? Absolutely. Okay. And the argument, it's not just about sex education, it's about drugs education as well. Because, of course, uh, you, you want to uh, discourage children from using drugs by making sure that they can use drugs safely. Patrick, you've got to tell them how to take the heroin and how to snort the cocaine. Uh, you've got to give them the details of, of how to do that because that's that's the only way to keep children safe. And they do in schools. They I've seen the trading cards deck, Mike. It's a pack of cards and it's got every single drug, recreational drug known to man, <laughs> yeah. and prescription drugs. And it's basically a how-to. And on the front it has this picture of the sort of the drug and on the back is kind of the uh, fact sheet and the instructional uh, information. Well, you could say it's instructional because it's telling them what's in it. Um, and so my friend's uh, daughter came home and she showed me this, uh, my neighbor the other day, or not the other day, but uh, a while ago. She said, look what they gave my f uh, 13 or 14 year old daughter. Mm. She saw this is like an instruction manual on how to use drugs. Immediately she pulled her kid out of that school, by the way, yep. put her in a private school. She said, I can't believe this is what they're pushing on kids in school. Well, is there a correlation between that and maybe uh, drug use uh, th with is, underage uh, ch children, maybe? This is the question. This is the question. But, uh, you know, the photographs of children from war zones, Patrick, the exploitation of children in photographs from war zones. We talked about this with, with Dusty Boy Omran, mm. uh, with Bana. Uh, but here we have the BBC over the weekend pushing out several f images from Reuters, Maya, Myanmar Rohingya. It says the injured sheltering in Bangladesh. Uh, and you can see a, a young child uh, curled up there uh, with, but it doesn't end there. Uh, the, some adult pictures as well. But the, these are very exploitative images, in my opinion, Patrick. The, the, this, is our, this is sort of like an Anne Leibowitz portrait uh, style documentary sort of exhibit here. I'm sure these will win lots of awards, Mike, 
well, in the documentary uh, and uh, Reuters competitions for documentary photography and so forth. But at the end of the day, what is it exactly? What does this tell us about the nature of this conflict? Does it tell us anything about the nature of the situation in Myanmar, in Bangladesh, in the wider geopolitical context, or is it using these children to sell a specific geopolitical agenda? That, that is the question. That is it. Now, uh, this is the one which really uh, I felt was well beyond the line as far as I'm concerned. We've got two young I don't know, seven, eight-year-old boys. Younger than that. Six, seven-year-old boys. Five, five, six. Naked. Uh, and we've got the boy yeah. on the right with his hand on the hip of the boy on the left. Uh, these two boys uh, demonstrating, uh, appearing to have burns uh, over quite a lot of their body. Yeah. Uh, and I just find this as exploited. In fact, I find this significantly more exploitative than the Omran picture. Look at this picture and tell me, what is the point of, of, of staging a picture like this, or even if it wasn't staged, what is the point of selecting this picture uh, in order to, the point should be to show their injuries, or maybe I could see to show the suffering, Mike, but to position it like this in the way that, that Reuters has done here. And it is uh, staged, it's clearly staged. It, it, and, and so the, I've, I've been with journalists and seen journalists out in the field and you know, some people just see it as a great picture. And this is, oh, that's an award-winning picture. This is kind of disturbing, actually. This is beyond disturbing, actually. But but it's even worse. It goes back to my initial point, Mike. Using these children to sell a foreign policy agenda. And we look at what's being said by, by the UK government, by the US State Department, by the European governments, Mike, about the Rohingya crisis about Myanmar, about the government uh, in Myanmar, um, and Sun Tzu Chi and so forth, falling out of favor with the West, these pictures are being used to basically spin up some sort of a call for action. What is that call for action? Why are they using children to push that agenda? Well, uh, here is uh, our favorite from the European Union, Federica Mogherini, who is in uh, Bangladesh uh, today on uh, World Children's Day, Universal Children's Day, whatever you want to call it. And this is exactly what she's doing over here as well, possibly virtue signaling. I'm not quite sure what, what, how you would describe it, but she's over there pretending that the European Union is doing uh, lots to help uh, the poor children uh, in Bangladesh that have come across the border from Burma, uh, saying that the European Union and member states are delivering more than half of the total financial support to Rohingya refugees. Uh, and my question again is, uh, where is this money going? What is it being used for? Uh, we, we never can find out. And when we ask the questions, we're denied the answers. Uh, so where is this international money being actually applied on the ground? Uh, she, says, uh, she said that seeing so many very young children taking care of even younger children is what strikes me the most. Uh, and this means that really we have to take care of entire generations. Women of just 20 years old have already, been, uh, have already experienced all the worst that life can bring. But this is another generated crisis. This is, and so it, what's interesting is uh, you see this new, what this is interesting is Federico Margarini, Mike, this is the EU's new outreach. This is the foreign policy arm. This is her behaving like a foreign minister for, for an, a federal super state. You've got it, you hit the nail on the head. This is, she's positioning herself now as the EU sort of uh, emissary in the crisis zones globally. What is she doing, Mike? She is rolling out the carpet. She is paving the way for the next phase in the EU's foreign intervention uh, uh, pro pro program, which is uh, a unified European military force that will be deployed in a peacekeeping fashion or to deliver aid, uh, probably to the beginning, Mike, to deliver aid and to assist in earthquakes. This is how the EU army will be rolled out initially. And so she's kind of laying the uh, diplomatic groundwork really for this by being present and sort of this is EU's outreach. And she's saying the subtext here, Mike, is don't worry, help is on the way. It's coming. Uh, just give us a couple of years to sort of uh, cross the T's and dot the I's. But a, a, a unified European military force is on the way. This is really what Federico Margarini is, 
is saying uh, in, in the subtext. Here. Uh, and again, using children. So uh, let's ask the question once again, where, who is really responsible for the majority of child exploitation that's going on at the moment? And let's, let's keep in mind uh, why uh, children end up as being uh, sexually exploited by people traffickers and so on. Uh, this is big business being supported by governments. And if you look at, I'll just leave us on this last point. If you look at foreign policy decisions by EU member states, by the United States, sanctions imposed as well that are arguably more damaging uh, than the proxy war in, in the long run of, on a country like Syria. And that has triggered and, and created a whole black market of human trafficking, organ trafficking, child exploitation, and also we look at Libya as well. That is a direct result of uh, EU member states, NATO policy, United States led, British led, French led. And the amount of child uh, exploitation and abuse and all sorts of uh, mm -hmm. things with people as a result of those situations created by European governments, created by the United States, literally created those situations, yeah. enabled them to happen. And then they go and use one of these children, Bana Alabed, from Syria, and the United Nations are using her to promote their UN goals. Uh, J.K. Rowling is championing this young child. They've exploited this eight-year-old girl, Banna of Aleppo, to push a geopolitical agenda, to demonize the government in Damascus, to justify all sorts of policies, including devastating economic sanctions. Devastating economic sanctions that have fueled the migrant crisis, that have fueled hyperinflation, that have fueled unemployment, that have fueled the recruitment of terrorists and people into extremist militias. Sanctions has done that. Denied people aid. Mm -hmm. Even UN aid is having trouble getting into Syria because of sanctions. And Banna, a child, is being used to promote that very policy, indirectly at least, uh, by Western governments and by the United Nations. That's pretty shameful on Universal Children's Day. Okay, let's move on, Patrick. Um, this is the, what the Washington Examiner, uh, the FBI has not verified the Trump dossier. I presume this is the Christopher Steele dodgy dossier that uh, Hillary Clinton helped finance. Yes, it's this, and it it's also includes a, a, a couple of other so-called points of the, uh, the, the, the Russian uh, meddling, if you will, uh, in the 2016 election. So uh, basically what we're finding out is what we already knew, really, uh, which is that this was all kind of spun up uh, for various reasons. And uh, an NSA whistleblower, uh, in fact, the architect of um, some of the programs that Edward Snowden uh, had uh, put out in his 20, 2013 leaks, the Snowden leaks. This is Bill Binney, who's come out to say, this is a great uh, article here in Strategic Culture Foundation, uh, basically saying that the whole Russia Gate um, uh, sort of conspiracy uh, is fake. And it's, it's for the expressed purpose of uh, keeping the, the war spending up. And, and if, if you look at the budget that was just uh, confirmed, that is just accepted, Mike, um, that's a 20% rise in the U.S. defense budget, up to $700 billion per year. Um, okay, so that's a, I mean, it's huge. The increase alone, I might add, the, uh, of the U.S. defense budget this year is equal, just the increase of $100 billion is more than the total Russian annual defense budget. Um, but the Russians are uh, increasing their defense budget. They have just started uh, remaking the strategic, uh, F strategic bombers. Uh, and uh, I believe that the new batch, the first of the new batch, are, to, are due to be uh, uh, running into flight tests and so on just after Christmas. Um, so the Russians are responding to this, uh, not anything like the scale that the United States is. But, but it's, they still, are it's still to going this. to trigger an arms race, Mike. So the fact that Russia has done this, which is, is it's relatively minor in compared to the sort of the collective uh, spending and equipment that that NATO member states have, but the fact that Russia has done this, Mike, is going to be seized upon by the West, by the U.S., by Britain, by France, and by the NATO countries, by the EU unified military force that's coming as a justification that we need to increase our new generation or roll out our new generation of stealth bombers to counter Russia's investment in long-range bombers. And here we have, Mike, another well, arms well, look, race. Here's, here's an article, uh, Hillary's Russian hack hoax, 
the biggest lie of this election season. This is from 21st Century War. But Patrick, I'm a bit confused because the date on this seems to be 2016. Yeah, uh, that was actually published on uh, November 1st, 2016. So that's a year and a bit ago. That's over a year ago. And, and we said what we already had been saying on the Sunday Wire in the previous six months, which is that the whole Russian hacking and Russian meddling is a giant hoax. It's completely fabricated. Uh, and the 17 agency claim is bogus. We said that over a year ago, <laughs> and uh, and I was attacked viciously uh, for for saying that. Um, so thanks to Bill Benny and other people, at least uh, you know there's a lot more people saying it now. And I think Mike, over time, it's going to be accepted as uh, historical fact. This will be one of the ultimate um, case studies of a complete culture of deception, lying, and scapegoating that the world has never seen before. This, to me, signifies the downfall of an empire. When you have to go to these, these lengths to uh, uh, resolve some internal political power struggle to sort of uh, cast your number one geopolitical foe uh, as, a, as a sort of some massive international criminal that's rigged your elections. I mean, to get to that point of desperation, like what Theresa May was trying to push uh, at, with, Ma yeah. at Mansion House last week, which is unbelievable <laughs> that she would try to push that out when the whole thing is collapsing. I find that to be amazing. Um, this will go down to history as one of the biggest lemons ever. Well, they keep saying, they, they brought Brexit into it, but Matthew Rycroft keeps saying Russia is resurgent. Russia is, uh, you know, pushing like crazy on its borders, and we've got to really be cared, scared of Russia. Pushing on its own borders. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ukraine, of course, is uh, because Russia invaded Ukraine, as we know, Patrick, didn't well, they? That's what they say. They, uh, well, I'm still hearing that claim that Russia invaded Ukraine, which I find quite interesting. So the European Union has decided to continue its mission in Ukraine, and the budget has been extended for a further year. Uh, so that's good. Ukraine yes. continues to rumble on. Good, and there's money. There's money being uh, processed there. Oh, by the way, I might add Theresa May's Mansion House speech, Mike. She said that Russia's annexation of Crimea, if you remember her words, yes. was the, uh, the first time that another European country had taken territory since World War II. Um, actually, Theresa, that's not actually true. What, uh, she wasn't fake news, was no, it? No, what about when Turkey uh, took uh, northern, northern Cyprus, Cyprus and has, still hasn't given it back? Mm. Uh, they annexed it, didn't they? That's NATO Turkey. Right? Mm. Uh, I think she forgot about that. That's tough. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, Patrick RT reporting that the U.S. is ready to fight for justice in Syria with or without United Nations approval. Uh, that's pretty strong words from, uh, what, is this, what is she, a lunatic? She is uh, the acceptable face of warmongering. Notice they uh, have uh, put Nikki Haley in, the, in this position there. She looks like, I don't know, she doesn't look well, but that's another question but who does in that in that role mike it's a it's a hugely uh well, matthew rycroft isn't exactly looking the best either no absolutely not in fact he probably looks worse than she does but so what she's saying here is that the united states is ready to go unilaterally uh in and to take out bashar al-assad is really what she's saying fight for justice or is nikki haley merely trying to justify a u.s military presence in syria that has long passed uh, left its sell-by date, basically. Um, ISIS news flash for Nikki Haley, memo, uh, UK column exclusive, uh, ISIS has been defeated in Syria. I don't know if she got the memo yet. And ISIS has been defeated in Iraq. So what's the U.S. doing in Syria? Trying to prop up a Kurdish state or trying to overthrow the government in Damascus? Please tell us exactly. What is now the justification because ISIS has uh, been defeated? So is that question the reason why, according to Global Research, uh, Mattis has, uh, as they describe it, gone off base? Uh, and uh, he says that uh, U.S. military presence in Syria has no legal grounds. Yeah, so this is interesting. We saw a lot of this under the Obama administration where you have this kind of good cop, bad cop divergence between the defense secretary and the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State. In that case, it was Ash Carter was making statements that were contrary to John Kerry's. And meanwhile, Obama was doing what he does best, which was to stay in the background and do his leading from behind. So with the Trump administration, uh, we're seeing this same sort of divergent. Seems like it's, to me, a little bit of good cop, bad cop there. But actually, if you take uh, prima facie, what 
James Mattis is saying there, the U.S. Defense Secretary, he's absolutely correct. The United States has no legal base. In fact, it never had any legal basis even doing anti-ISIL operations in Syria either. So, uh, but he's absolutely correct. They have no basis what, whatsoever. Neither do the British, neither do the French or anybody else who's running around uh, covertly or overtly in Syria right now. Time to get out. Uh, absolutely. But the uh, focus seems to have shifted now towards Iran somewhat. It has. It has. So uh, Lebanon uh, being uh, the country where Hezbollah uh, is resident, uh, is, Hezbollah is supported by Iran. So in terms of the U.S.-Israeli-Saudi agenda, that axis, and I'm going to use the word axis, I know that's not politically correct, but those axis powers, because they are working like an axis, uh, the U.S., Saudi, and Israel um, have this sort of common interest, uh, which is to eliminate Hezbollah as a threat. And it's almost like, Mike, if you're going to attack Iran, uh, then you need to sort of eliminate the uh, uh, threats around, immediately around Israel. Uh, one of those would be Hezbollah. Easier said than done, unfortunately. And meanwhile, uh, the Lebanese Prime Minister, uh, Saad Hariri, is doing his European uh, and World Whistles Top Tour uh, even being introduced as the Lebanese Prime Minister mm. on one of those occasions. Mm. It's absolutely bizarre. So what does Saudi Arabia get out of this? Uh, it's not exactly clear, um, but I think it's pretty clear that Israel um, definitely has this issue with uh, Hezbollah, and they're still trying to characterize them as a terrorist organization, when in fact that's not actually the case today. Uh, they're actually in politics, and I think this is one of the things that really irks U.S. people. They can't understand uh, why Hezbollah is so successful, uh, and they can't understand how they've managed to be successful in, in a number of areas, politically and militarily, and also uh, with Iran support. It's, it's even more of a threat uh, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and in terms of the United States, the United States politicians, Mike, are just going to do uh, what uh, the Israeli lobby tells them to do. And if it's that you have to hate Hezbollah today, they will hate Hezbollah today because they're paid to have those views. They themselves don't actually have any skin in the game as such. So, this, But this is an Israeli-led agenda. And it just so happens that this coincides with Saudi's interests as well vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Now, you've mentioned uh, EU military unification. And of course, uh, uh, recently I wrote an article on the UK Column website uh, about Theresa May's being car cards being on the table with regard to this issue. And I asked uh, viewers and listeners to perhaps contact their MPs uh, with that article and ask for comment. And I've got to thank everybody that has done that. We've had quite a number of responses back. Um, so here is one here. This is from uh, Richard Grosvenor Plunkett, uh, Earl, Earl Drax, uh, known as Richard Drax, Tory party uh, MP and uh, former British Army officer and journalist. Uh, he says, thank you for your email and your patience awaiting response. Uh, the government has always been crystal clear that defence is a national, not an EU responsibility. In no circumstances could Brussels direct deployment of UK forces without the specific agreement of the UK government. And if an EU army were to be proposed, it would be subject to national veto. Therefore, while the UK remains a full member of the EU until such time as we leave it, UK forces will not be part of an EU army, right? So that was uh, one response. Uh, here's another response from Colonel the Right Honourable John Mark Lancaster, uh, who is also a British Conservative Party politician. And he says, the government has always been crystal clear that the defence is a national uh, not an EU responsibility. In no circumstances could Brussels direct deployment of UK forces without the specific agreement of the UK government. And if an EU army were to be proposed, it would be subject to national veto. <laughs> Therefore, while the UK remains a full member of the EU until such time as we leave it, UK forces will not be part. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm not. They copied and pasted the same answer. No, 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 Patrick. What is this? This, is, this has come from Tory Central Office. So this has come from Tory central office. This is the Tory line. So, the, so, the, so, so they're checking, they're vetting the questions through Tory central office. They're copying and pasting the identical answers Absolutely. to constituents? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's this is the Tory the, party line. And if a, anybody has any doubt, therefore, that what the UK column and David Ellis and others have been saying about European Union military, military unification, this should, uh, you know, get your... Uh, interest 
at the very least, why would they feel the need to push out a party line in this way? Yeah, at least uh, at least uh, change the wording a little bit to make it seem, you know, original. Uh, no, no, there's no need to do that at so, all. So basically, that the 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 MP or whoever is that's not really them talking, is it? That's the party. This is the party. That's this the, is the party. party. It's come from the central party office. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Interesting. Okay. A uh, bit of uh, finance news then. Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal. Emerging markets bonds falter as investors rush to the exits. It's not just emerging markets bonds. It's U.S. corporate bonds as well, the junk debt bonds. Uh, $3 trillion is what they're valued at at the moment. Uh, and uh, this is $3 trillion. The, the junk debt bu uh, bubble is part of the $14 trillion uh, U.S. corporate debt bubble, so it's three trillion of it, uh, and people have decided that actually this is worth nothing after all, and they're now running for the doors. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we wait to see if this has any particular contagion effect, uh, and whether this uh, contagion spreads to other markets. Uh, but the key point is that what have we seen? We've seen a, ha a quarter of a percent rise in interest rates in the UK, and we've seen some very small, I can't remember the exact uh, percentage rise in the United States, and already it's having this effect on the, on the markets. Just that small, Just that small, small rise. rate rise. So uh, we've, got to, we've got to keep a close eye on this, uh, and if they try to push interest rates up any higher, uh, we see how much further this spreads. Do, so do you think this indicates, Mike, uh, how delicate the current status quo is the sort of the current propped up fiat status quo. How that, that only a quarter of a percent interest rate rise might have a cascading effect already like this. What hap what would happen if they raised it two points, Mike? Uh, Patrick, this has been uh, something that we've been talking about for a few years now. The level of debt the level of debt has not been dealt with. That issue has not been dealt with since the financial crash of 2007, 2008. In fact, the levels of debt have increased. increased. Uh, and we might have moved it from mortgages into corporate debt, uh, mm -hmm. and into other forms of debt. Student but loans, car loans. All, all this kind yeah. of stuff. Uh, consumer debt is a, con is a mm -hmm. massive concern. Um, my, my personal view is that um, the corporate debt uh, issue is probably the biggest issue because uh, we have lots of companies uh, that have vastly overextended themselves on the basis of uh, zero percent uh, negative interest rates, zero percent interest rates. Uh, and uh, we could see, uh, you know, we had uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer over the weekend uh, saying that there's no unemployment in Britain at the moment. Uh, in fact, there's 1.45 uh, million unemployed people in Britain at the moment. But he said there's no unemployment in Britain. Nobody's without a job. Uh, and, uh, well, that situation could change uh, as good as it is relative to pa the past. That situation could change significantly if the corporate debt bubble bursts. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, what do we have? Well, we have uh, the Panamanian government, uh, the Panamanian president over uh, meeting Xi Jinping in China. Uh, and, uh, well, the relations with Panama turn over a new leaf. Apparently, this is because uh, in June this year, Panama decided that uh, it would drop its support for Taiwan and it uh, re reorganized itself and, and decided that it would uh, reinstate diplomatic relationship with with China itself. Uh, and so uh, they signed uh, over the weekend 19 accords between the two countries uh, in a memorandum of understanding of cooperation in the framework of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road Initiative. Uh, and of course, 19 accords. That's sort of symbolic of the fact that it was recently the 19th uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, National Congress. Uh, and then over the weekend also we had uh, the uh, Panama's uh, TVN2 television uh, making uh, noting one of the uh, responses or one of the, the, the benefits of this that they're going to start a direct flight between uh, Panama and Beijing uh, in the not too distant future. But on top of that, we've got other projects in Brazil, in Argentina, in Mexico, in Bolivia. Uh, and so China absolutely moving forward with this. Uh, we have a former French prime minister saying that the EU needs to be getting in on this and playing an active role in China's One Belt, One Road project. Um, so, you know, where is this going to end? We've got uh, the Western markets, as we've just said, in major danger. And we've got uh, China using this junk uh, U.S. debt that it holds uh, and using that for productive purposes at the moment. Uh, and lots and lots of countries jumping on board that. 
uh, because China wants to get rid of this paper, this U.S. paper that they're holding as quickly as possible and turn it into real physical assets. Well, they launder it through Panama. But look at this. The EU should play an active role in China's One Belt, uh, One Road project. They are actually, Frederico Margarini uh, is playing an active role there in Rohingya uh, because China does have a project that cuts right through Myanmar to give it access to the seaport there, a major shortcut. Uh, and that is effectively part of its One Belt, One Road initiative. The question is, uh, is the EU uh, emissary there to disrupt, disrupt, that. disrupt that program, or is she there to get in and get on the program? But the Panama thing is fascinating, Mike. Um, the, what's important about Panama is not just the Panama Canal mm. and who is really in control of that and who's putting the most amount of investment in that, but there is another canal, Mike, that a lot of people are not aware of that's going via Lake Nicaragua. And guess who is running point on that project for the last 10 years? China mm -hmm. has. So while the U.S. has been mucking around trying to destroy the Middle East and uh, extract uh, the oil uh, from the sands of the Middle East and overturn various countries uh, in Central Asia, China has been busy doing what the United States should have done uh, 50 years ago. Uh, which was come up with a more modern alternative uh, for international trade than this sort of 100-plus-year-old tiny Panama Canal that's just about wide enough to get a barge uh, that you get through Maida Vale Lock uh, to get that through Panama as well. You know, why didn't they think of doing this 50 years ago? And so what's, what are they going to do now? And also the, the uh, Panama is an offshore destination mm -hmm. for Chinese uh, finance. So is China going to enter the world of international finance in a much bigger way in the Western Hemisphere? And will Panama City be the vehicle for that to happen? That's going to be interesting looking forward. Okay. Um, now back to the UK. Uh, 1.6 billion pounds is going into a transforming cities fund. Uh, that's good, Patrick, isn't it? Uh, this is the uh, biggest ever increase in research and development uh, investment is what they're saying. And uh, it's also going to fund a new transform transport connections. Uh, that's what they're going to do with city regions across the country. Uh, now, <laughs> this, of course, is the front that they're putting on the whole thing. Uh, we're going to develop research and development and we're going to develop uh, transportation. Uh, that's the front that they're putting on it Smart. for the £1.7 billion pound Transforming Cities Fund. Smart cities, right? Uh, uh, well, uh, indeed, that's, that is part and parcel of it, but it also massive political changes because, uh, of course, we're devolving uh, political power from central government out to the regions, to the city-states. Uh, these are becoming city-states with their own governance. Uh, and, uh, well, the question in my mind, Patrick, is whose policy agenda is this? Is, it, is this the British government's policy agenda or could it be somebody else's? Uh, here's the Rockefeller Foundation with their Transform Cities uh, website. Mm. Uh, here is uh, Siemens, uh, pop, pop, sorry, Transforming Cities Through uh, better, sorry, for the better through sustainable technology. This is not uh, a British uh, policy, British government policy. This is a globalist uh, policy being driven through think tanks, uh, NGOs, and uh, and rocket and foundations and trusts. And not driven in the public sphere. Uh, why is this not something so fundamental, Mike, uh, in terms of a change in our structure of government? Uh, in what they call governance. Why is this not being debated and discussed on the floor of the House of Commons? Why is this not a major agenda issue in Westminster uh, and also in Congress and Senate in the United States uh, as well? Because that's part of it as well. This is being driven out of Chicago uh, and uh, Mark Anderson's reports on the uh, global parliament of mayors and the Chicago um, uh, cities. I think it was the, uh, the name of the international conference that they have yeah, absolutely, every yeah. year. But yeah. that's being driven out of America as well. So we see this uh, transatlantic synergy. Why is this not being discussed uh, enough in public? Is this just being run through under, uh, under the radar, Mike, until a point where it just becomes a fait accompli? That, that's exactly Or a solution on. to be presented to some crisis in the future? Well, no, not even a crisis in the future. This is being driven mainly uh, by the fact that national governments, and Donald Trump in particular, are refusing to get on board the Paris Climate Accords. Mm. Uh, so, so cities are saying, well, uh, we don't need national governments, then we will press ahead with this uh, policy ourselves. We'll do it independently of the nation state. And, and what by doing that, what they're doing is building uh, a political infrastructure which wasn't there before, and they're recreating the uh, 
you know, the, the, the historical concept of, of the nation, of the, the city state, uh, the pre uh, Westphalian nation state idea of a city state. It's, it's a very dangerous uh, uh, direction to go in because uh, uh, we, we are seeing the end of, of nations at this point. So, this is a good example of how the international climate agenda. They don't call it global warming anymore. It's now climate agenda. Uh, is has become the raison d'être for the city-state global agenda. You see, the synergy there is absolutely undeniable, Mike. Now, yeah. uh, and as you pointed out, these these cities and states in the U.S. as well can can sort of pursue these international governance agendas independently, or they're they're willing to do this independently mm -hmm. of their national government. So, absolutely, this would undermine. Uh, the uh, nation state yeah. and is. Okay, we will end on uh, Charles Manson, Patrick. This is uh, quite, quite a fascinating story. I think anybody who's not fascinated by this story, uh, look, Charles Manson dies at the tender age, Mike, of 83 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, Sharon Tate murders a uh, cult leader, Amazing story, uh, and there's also, if you, if you really look back, you read any of um, Dave McGowan's um, books on this and sort of the links between uh, the Manson cults and uh, the CIA, for instance, and some of the intelligence agencies in America running or involved in some of these organizations. Um, it's fascinating history. Okay, well, we will end it there. Thank you very much, Patrick, for today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be back at the same time, 1 o'clock tomorrow. If you like what the UK Column does, please consider uh, supporting us by taking out a subscription or making a donation because uh, your help uh, really helps us uh, continue to do what we're doing. Uh, so we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.